Welcome back to Sister Circle Live. All month, we've been honoring our past, examining our present, and working on solutions for our future in our Bridging the Gap series. We saluted civil rights leader and living black history ambassador Andrew Young and gained his wisdom and knowledge. We celebrated black love in all of its beauty and we got a sneak peek at our future with the mighty men of Morehouse and heard their issues and concerns. <laughs> we sure did. And today we are tackling criminal justice reform. We asked civil rights attorney Benjamin Crump, Georgia State Representative Park Cannon and Department of Corrections Chief Patrick Labatt to join us and discuss this issue from their perspectives. I sat down with these three extraordinary individuals and heard about their challenges as a lawyer, a lawmaker, and law enforcer officer. Here's Bridging the Gap Criminal Justice Reform. Let's just jump right into this. Um, often a lot of people think crim criminal justice reform and also prison reform is the same thing. Is it or not? It's different. When you look at criminal justice reform, you're looking at things that would help keep people out of prison and make sure they're treated justly before they get there. Prison reform is more about what happens when someone is in prison. That looks at things like having doulas if someone is pregnant or possibly mm -hmm. saying you can't shackle a pregnant woman. That's very different than criminal justice reform, which is like a police accountability bill, mm -hmm. saying if they are doing things that are considered excessive use of force before you're incarcerated, then those need to be looked at by the state government. Well, Ben, we all know you as uh, the people's champ, I like to call you. You know, we've seen you uh, fight uh, for the likes of um, Trayvon Martin, Mike Brown, um, and uh, Tamira Rice. Uh, what are some of the challenges when you are really trying to uh, get justice for these families? Well, a lot of it is the systemic racism that's built into the institutions of governance in America. So the individuals don't matter quite. If the institution is the same, you're going to get the same outcomes. So that's what we have been fighting for 400 years, the institution of racism. Uh, Chief Pat, coming yes, from uh, the law enforcement component, what are you faced with on the opposite side? It's a tough situation. You, we're asking young men and women, literally millennials, to go out and do what other people don't do, mm. and mostly in the middle of the night. And so we're scared in, a, in an environment where we're asking people to stop what they think are either potential law enforcement uh, or law-breaking citizens or whatever that mm -hmm. looks like from the perspective of being out in the middle of the night. I, we, we got two 21-year-old young men, yes. right? And, and a family of four uh, or millennials but, I, but now you're giving them the responsibility to enforce laws and even take a life. And so the communication gap or closing it and having these conversations with, with attorneys like you know, Benjamin Crump and, and training, that becomes what really gets us through that moment. From your standpoint as the legislator. When you have lawmakers who are not fully seeing black women, women of color, as wonderful contributors to the community, they further these implicit mm -hmm. and explicit biases in their lawmaking. Let's move forward to uh, talking a little bit about the political attention that we see celebrities are getting right now uh, from the likes of Yo Gotti, Meek Mills, Kim Kardashian. There are being innocent people who are now being released. Now do we think that this is just a trend or is it really truly making an impact? I think anything that uh, celebrities are able to engage in and helping uh, is well intended. All right. Uh, as long as we are focused on that piece. Now, are, are certain celebrities being used to bolster uh, individuals' prominence and or attempts to re for re-election? Absolutely. Absolutely. That doesn't make it right at all, but we have to figure out the, the we have to be supportive when it's time to be supportive, but at the same time, understand that a lot of it is just politics. Let's talk a little bit about the uh, disparity of black and brown people being uh, disproportionately targeted. What can we do differently here and why is it happening? Well, we certainly know why it's happening. It's because the prison industrial complex. Uh, America as the most uh, prominent educated yes. nation in the world still incarcerates more people by far than any other developed country 
in the world. We have to look at this fact that black men in America at most make up 7% of the population. But in many states, we make up almost 50% of the population on death row. Because America tells you, without saying a word, if you kill a white person in America, you are going to death row because we value their life over everybody else. You kill black and brown people? Maybe not. But what I hear you saying is it's it's true and it's almost like as a child, especially the, in, in the African American black community, we're kind of taught that. Yes. Like, you know, like, oh, you better mess with a white person because if you do, you know, you, you'll go to jail for that or you'll get killed for that. But we don't place that same value system or we're not taught that the same sentiments do, does not echo when it comes down to just us. That's why I think police, mm -hmm. you know, a black person can move a certain way and they shoot first and ask questions later, but you can be a confirmed mass murderer mm -hmm. and be a young white man like in Parkland, Florida, shoot 34 people, killing 17 of them. They follow you for hours and take your life. The Waffle House shooting in Tennessee, mm -hmm. shot six people, killing four of them. The police followed him into the woods and all of them came out alive. Can you imagine if that was a black person killed somebody, the police going in the woods, do you think he would go, come out alive? I got stopped as, as a young black man uh, over and off of uh, Cascade, <laughs> probably driving a little too fast, but I was stopped by somebody that looked like me. And, and, and here's the worst part about it. Even then, and, and I'll get hate mail behind this, even then I thought it was going to be a fair exchange, but even as chief, I've been stopped hmm. in an unmarked vehicle and it wasn't a fair exchange. And so I have to remind people you have to learn how to talk to people mm -hmm. because that creates that fair exchange from that perspective. Park, what do you, you, you got a lot to say. I see it on your face. It's so interesting when we think about the training that can possibly mm -hmm. happen, not just in law enforcement, but in other places. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Look at implicit bias training in schools, in hospitals, in daycare centers, across our nation. If we were actually sitting down and having the conversations about race that we stopped having, in my parents' generation in the 60s, then we might get further. Well, when you're looking at racial profiling, when you're looking at what happens in that actual emotional lack of empathy interchange between two people, you are seeing cultural differences. Yes, you are. There's nothing wrong with people being from different places, but when the people who are in power seem to always be from one place and the people who are disenfranchised or not, this is where community action is necessary. We want more people to take action, look into these elected seats, and try to get one. When we're talking about people who have been falsely accused and wrongly convicted, and they've spent a stint, uh, 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 an extensive period of time of their lives locked away behind bars, and then, you know, somehow, some way, we find that they, they've been exonerated, okay? What truly happens in terms of uh, them being able to pick up and successfully rejoin society again? I, the second part of the question is this. If a person is indeed exonerated, is, does that completely wipe their record clean? Let me answer you directly, Quad. Please. I'm on the board of directors for the Innocence Project. The Innocence Project put statistics out that say at least, at least, a hundred thousand people are sitting in prison who are completely innocent in American prisons. That number could be as high as 200,000, but they know at least 100,000. And the vast majority of them are black people, black men, but you know, the quickest growing demographic of people being incarcerated in America today is women of color. So it's not just about our little boys anymore, it's also about our little girls. And the reality is this, Quad, the fact that no matter what the situation is, poor people of color are gonna get the most of injustice 
and the least of justice. So when you talk about them being proven completely innocent, well, you have the judges and the prosecutors really holding back, and even the lawmakers holding back on giving them an actual order of innocence. Okay. Because at that point, then there has to be some re accountability and some compensation. Yes, it does. And what these white prosecutors mostly, white police officers and white judges who said, just lock the little black or brown person up. We don't really care about the evidence. And then when they're proven to have stolen this person's life, they don't want to pay for it. So I, I think it does boil down to compensation. But you have to applaud our uh, district attorney here for starting an integrity unit that does nothing but look at cases that are called a question. And so where people have spent years in jail, yes. he's starting to really put together a platform to get individuals released. The other thing that we have to look at is how society views people coming out of the system, regardless of whether they were convicted or proven innocent later or whatever that looks like. But that's why we started our Second Chance program, which literally, we talked about this earlier, mm -hmm. literally moves people back into an environment where they can become city employees get a paycheck, instead of leaving with $25 and a bus ticket, they leave with $25,000, a sense of dignity, and more importantly, a job. Wow, okay. So we had a group of men from Morehouse here, uh, and you know, we, we basically asked them, what is uh, something that they're looking for in their presidential um, uh, candidate? What's most important to them? And there was a young man, a freshman at, at Morehouse, his name is Benny, and he says, you know, I'm most concerned about criminal justice reform. He says, I'm young, but every day that I go out, I'm afraid, and I'm afraid of being pu pulled over by the police. Um, if he were here before you, what would you say to him? And this is a question for each of you. Mm -hmm. I would tell him there's hope on the horizon, right? Uh, stay engaged. And, and certainly, here's the thing that, that I do personally, uh, many, many chiefs don't and, and many officers don't, is I give them my phone number, right? Let's continue to have this conversation. I'm a firm believer as long as we're communicating, we can do better. Right? But there are also, here's the piece that uh, many police agencies and, and sheriff's officers around the country lose sight of, is listening to what he has to say. Certainly, I, I would remind them the overarching theme of my book is simply this, Quad. We have to make sure our children are more intelligent than their oppressors. And they have to understand that you gotta be more intelligent. The time to challenge the police is not on the street. I mean, if they pull you up at night, you turn that light Absolutely. on in the car, you put your hands at 10 and 2, you tell him, once he asks for your insurance and registration, you have asked for it, I'm going to move my right hand to the glove compartment because you cannot be cute and get smart because it may cost you your life. That's true. That is the reality. Yeah. The time to fight it's the in police court. is That's in right. the courtroom yeah. right. and yeah. with your parents, with lawyers, with uh, uh, legislators and yeah. uh, leaders. And that is one of the first parts of being intelligent, yeah. surviving the stop. Yeah. And we can't surviving take that for granted. I, I have a brother, right? And so I remember our family sitting down and us having those conversations about whether he's safer here in South Georgia or in Atlanta. And those are difficult conversations. So I want to hug Benny. And you know, the lover in me wants to say, we'll get through it together, but the pragmatic person uh, that I am also says, go after the Georgia Legislative Black Caucus internship. Mm -hmm. Be at the state capitol to be in those hearings. If no one else hears them say something that is racially ridiculous, you heard it and yes. you bring that information back to the caucus. Run for office. I was 23 when I decided to do it, 24 when I got elected. So many people said that it was not possible, but what we know is that millennials are actually up to age 40 they have kids they have mortgages <laughs> and jobs and cars and so if we expand the scope of people who are doing the equity work i believe that we will have justice wow mm. yeah make sure you pick up attorney crump's book legalized genocide of colored people wherever fine books are sold